Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Chad Daly from the Marathon County Public Library, and today we are here to talk about women's suffrage. Last month, of course, was the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment that gave women the right to vote. And today we are going to hear from Ben Clark, archivist at the Marathon County Historical Society, on the impact of that here in Marathon County. We're now seven minutes after two. Let's get things started. And I will hand things over to Ben Clark for our presentation today. Thank you very much for joining us today, folks. We will have some time for questions. Uh, if you have a question, go ahead and type it in the chat and um, <clears throat> we will go from there. Thank you very much for tuning in. And here is Ben. Yeah, hello. All right, just get going here. Yeah, welcome to the... Uh, Marathon County Historical Society's History Chats on the Air. It's the first uh, uh, attempt at this in a digital format. So um, I'm excited to be able to share some history about the, the suffrage movement in, um, in Marathon County. Of, um, all right, there we go. Cool. Yeah, so um, as, as, as Chad said, this is the, uh, a good time to be talking about the, um, the historical uh, sort of implications of the 19th Amendment as it is a century in the past, uh, a century ago, uh, in that last month, uh, women were able to, to vote for the very first time in, uh, in municipal elections and basically without, without any restrictions. Um, and this is, this is a pretty, pretty big moment. Um, and so you know, naturally we've had lots of discussions and, and I'm, if you're like me, maybe you've, you've t tuned into some of these you know, documentaries or discussion, round table discussions, interviews that have been taking place over the last few uh, you know, weeks, months. Um, you know, when it comes to this, the, you know, the topic here for, you know, for, for, um, for us in Marathon County, you know, whenever we do one of these programs, we always kind of want to what you say, what is the, what's the impact here? Um, you know, you can, you can go out and you can find a lot of different information about Susan B. Anthony or Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Alice Paul, you know, these, these women that were, you know, titans of this movement and the letter writing campaigns and the, you know, all of the stuff that was happening um, that, that achieved, uh, you know, federal suffrage for, for women at the federal level. Um, but, you know, I always have to wonder, like, what's happening here in Marathon County, which isn't, isn't particularly well documented in central Wisconsin, um, in part because it is, you know, women's history is not always as well, uh, you know, talked about as, as you know, general history. Uh, but there's also, it, it turns out there's a little bit more to this. Um, so I, all that is to say that, um, you know, this is a, a, a the history of of the the, the women's uh, suffrage movement here in Marathon County, um, and our goal is to kind of see what's happening here. We will talk about the general story. Um, I will also point out that this is a topic that even a week ago I was still finding more information um, and was tempted to pull on a couple threads even you know yesterday uh, that could have led to more. There's a lot more to uncover. Um, so in the grand scheme of things, this is what we found, and I think it's going to be you know very helpful. Uh, you know, an interesting topic, but um, but there's still more. And uh, yeah, so let's jump into it. To contradict what I just said, we are going to start with Con Susan B. Anthony, um, who happens to be a pretty good, you know, way into, um, you know, the, the, the topic. Uh, she is probably the most famous, well-known um, suffragists in, um, you know, the, the history um, of, of the movement in the United States. Uh, but she also is important here in Marathon County because in 1870, um, nine, um, let's see, hold on. I'm just going to double check that this is, yeah. Okay. Um, in 1879, she visits Wausau. Um, and this is a, a pretty big, big thing. Um, she comes here under the auspices of the La Ladies Literary Society uh, from Wausau. Uh, we'll talk more about them in, in detail later. Uh, but they, they bring her in. She's part, uh, the year before, the Susan B. Anthony bill um, was introduced to Congress. That's the bill that's going to eventually become the 19th Amendment. But you know we're a little, little further away from that in 1879. Um, and she, she comes and she, you know, as she did much, much of her life, she was traveling from city to city, you know, giving talks and, and trying to convince people. Um, she, as well as Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who, by the way, was also sort of the other pillar of the, this era uh, of the movement. Um, she also came to Wausau the same year, um, or possibly 1880. It's a little unclear from the sources, but both of them went and they spoke at the music hall in Wausau, the, the, the 
sort of place where people went. And um, yeah, we're told by the, the accounts at the time that, you know, there wasn't a whole lot of sympathy necessarily for their cause, but, you know, they were nationally known names. People, people knew who they were. And um, so, you know, wanted to hear what they had to say. So they would tune in and say, okay, you know, or not tune in, uh, show up, they packed the hall. And, um, you know, they, they listened, right? Respectfully, apparently, they, nobody got up and walked away or shouted them down or anything like that. But, you know, the, the, the sources of the time say that maybe it's not the most um, convincing. Nobody walked away like, okay, yeah, I'm going to dedicate my life to the cause too. But of course, that is the the men. That's the men who are writing about that. And I think, you know, with due respect to the the, the people at the time, I, I would imagine that actually the women were pretty fired up because about two weeks after Susan B. Anthony visits in 1879, we have a women's Christian temperance union started here. Now, what what does Christian, what, the temperance movement have to do with the suffrage movement? Um, a lot, actually. Um, the suffrage movement really kind of gets its you know start, um, at least as an organizational thing, a lot of times through suffrage, uh, through temperance, uh, such as Susan B. Anthony herself was a, was a temperance person who came to the cause through it. Um, temperance, by the way, is the idea that, well, it starts as this idea in the early part of the 1800s that we need to temper our indulgence of alcohol. We shouldn't, you know, overdo it because that's a, that can be a problem. But by the middle of the century, it becomes a crusade. It's a movement to, you know, we want a national prohibition of alcohol. We want to get rid of alcohol and make it illegal because, you know, I might make the decision that I'm not going to drink, but my neighbor might not. And, you know, there's other people that are, are indulging and there's, there's social problems that come along with this. Um, it becomes a women's issue actually at this time, because, you know, if you think about, you know, the separate spheres for men and women, this is kind of an old concept, but really becomes formulated and, and, you know, situated in the physicality in the 1800s, um, because of industrialization, you know, men are leaving the home. And so they're their work that they do, whether that's business or politics or military, whatever, whatever that is, is physically outside of the home. Whereas all the things that were, you know, typically expected of women, you know, cooking, cleaning, raising the children, those are all in the home. So there's this physicality of women's place is in the home and men's sphere then becomes the public sphere. And so in this context, alcohol, if that's a social problem, and it, and it is a, a problem for society at this point, uh, for, for especially from certain perspectives, you know, if you're, uh, if I'm a housewife living in 1840, 1850, you know, and my husband goes off and, you know, spends his paycheck every night uh, at the bar before he comes home, you know, I don't have the ability to maintain the, the home. Um, he could, you know, become coming home drunk and abusive. He could be you know, unfaithful, getting involved in seedier elements of society. And so the idea that, or, or at the very least, like drinking himself to an early grave because of the, the health problems with alcohol. And so it becomes this thing that we need to protect women. The suffrage movement is all, or the temperance movement is all about, you know, protecting, making a better world so that women who don't really have much agency to combat alcohol, right? They can't just walk down to the breweries and say, would you please kindly stop making uh, uh, any more beer because my husband is, is drinking himself to an early grave? Like that's not going to work. So it becomes sort of a movement to protect women. It's very coded in that way. And women are getting involved, maybe not as leaders of the Sons of Temperance or any those sort of organizations, but they are learning and they're sort of making connections. They're learning about how do you run uh, you know, education programs and in contact with other people. And by the 1870s, when the, the Sons of Temperance in Wisconsin is kind of falling apart, the Women's Christian Temperance Union becomes this sort of group that is, is taking up the cause of temperance, but not just temperance, other women's issues as well, issues like child um, uh, ch child labor, um, or what they called pro white prostitution, or, you know, prostitution, uh, sorry, white slavery, which would be like prostitution and sex trafficking and things like that. So, you know, these are issues, again, that women are affected by, the home is affected by, but women don't on their own usually have the means to do much about it because it happens, you know, outside the home. So, by the 1870s, the, these groups like the Women's Christian Temperance Union who are, who are advocating for this sort of change, it makes sense then that they would say, you know, maybe it's, it would be better if we could vote because then we could actually make some changes on our own. So this is how women like Susan B. Anthony and these ladies who get fired up in Wausau in 1879 go from being something that is, is, has a social sort of impetus, uh, you know, we want to better the world around us to going to the idea of voting.
And I should say, there are also many women who just look at the world and say, this is inherently unfair. You know, women pay taxes, women are counted in the census, and yet they aren't able to have the opportunity to say what that those taxes go towards or who represents them. You know, our nation was built on the model, you know, one of the, 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 the snappy phrases, uh, no taxation without representation. And yet, you know, women, women are, are not represented. So there are sort of equalists as well as, you know, maybe more of a, a temperance sort of this group would be more of a social feminism sort of perspective. So it's a big tent. But the main thing here I want to say is at this point in the 1870s and going forward, you know, you cannot separate temperance from suffrage. They are pretty much the same thing. Um, so uh, we have a, a group of, of women getting involved in temperance here. And from this, in 1870, also in 1879, we're told that there is a Marathon County Women's Suffrage Association formed. For that, we need to go to Schofield and this article here, which surprised me. Um, I did not know about this group until I came across this article probably about a month and a half, two months ago. But here they are um, getting together for a suffrage uh, meeting. Um, this is published in 1887, so it's going to be a few years uh, in the future here. But this is maybe the high point of the suffrage movement in Marathon County, at least in this sort of iteration. Um, a bunch of ladies, including the author uh, Jeannie Palmeroy, comes up from Grand Rapids, which is Wisconsin Rapids. And they, you know, come up to Schofield where they're being hosted. Um, there's most of the people are from Wassa and Schofield, uh, and they get together to celebrate the 65th, 67th anniversary of Susan B. Anthony's birthday, or her her 67th birthday. Um, they sing some suffrage songs. They have some food. They read from an, a biography of Mrs. Anthony. Um, they have some discussion. What's interesting is the names that are named here. Um, right. Um, Jeannie Palmer is from Grand Rapids. Jane Armstrong, she is uh, the first school teacher in Schofield. You know, the Bentleys, Collies, Graves, Grays, they're all Schofield, sort of part of that circle in Schofield. Um, Dr. Elsie Clark is one of the first female physicians in Wassa. Um, M.A. Hurley is a lawyer in Wassa. And um, and so, uh, yeah, um, you have some professionals, you have some local people in Schofield, but it is really the Mrs. Gray that we need to talk about because she's going to be the person that turns to be out to be very important and probably was the leader of this entire sort of movement here. So this is the first that I can find of her. This is Elmedia Harney at this point, um, where she's living in 1850 in Schofield um, as a 17 year old with her brother, George, um, who comes here presumably for the, for the lumber industry. I know they're in Schofield because they're boarding with William Schofield, it's the boarding house of William Schofield's uh, mill. Um, you know, there's not much else in there. Actually, there is no Schofield because, you know, there's no, basically right now, there's two townships in Marathon County, which gets founded in 1850. So this is right at the beginning. There's everything that's east of the river and west of the river, the Wisconsin. Um, so they're, west, uh, they're, they're east of the river and they're in what's going to be Schofield. Um, also boarding with here is a man named John Gray, who is going to become uh, Omedia's husband, um, probably 18, somewhere after 1850. Uh, you know, the church records aren't exactly up to date at a time when there really wasn't a church or a government really. So who knows? Uh, but at some point between 1850 and 1855, I'm fairly certain they got married and uh, set off um, on, on, on life together. Uh, John Gray is going to become a pretty successful uh, mill operator. Um, he's going to go off to what's going to be Cronenwetter. Um, this is 1882 or so, but this is the land that is owned by the Grays. And um, pretty extensive, uh, become fairly successful. Notably, or kind of interestingly, the, the, the white bits up here, or the yellow bits up here, I hope you can kind of see that on the stream. Those yellow bits are owned by not John Gray, not Mrs. John Gray, but A.B. Gray, which is how El Media decided uh, is, is often referred to. And this is maybe a good opportunity to say, you know, if you haven't picked up on this already, this is still very early. This is still a story like, I don't really know a whole lot about her life in this era. Um, I don't know how she owns land and pays taxes on that land, which I know she did, but what was she up to? What was the reason? You know, usually you don't see women owning land in the 1880s or 1860s, 70s in this era, but she did. Um, and that's just one, one remarkable sort of insight into what was probably a very remarkable woman. I do know that in the 1870s, she gets involved in temperance. And from that, she gets involved sort of probably with that group in Wassa in 1879. They then come to suffrage as, as, as a cause. Uh, 
there is no statewide organization at this point in 1879. Well, that's not true. There technically was. In 1869, there was a little group that got started, but it, it petered out pretty quickly as, as the, the leaders kind of left town and were unable to, to stay active. But uh, by the end of the um, 1880s, in, in the 1880s, you see a resurgence. Um, Almedia Gray and some other uh, tough suffrage oriented people, leaders in the state, get together in 1882 and form a new chapter of the Wisconsin Women's Suffrage Association, a new version of it, I should say. Um, and and Almedia is not just there. She is a leader. She is um, the chairman of the executive committee, and she's going to hold offices like the financial officer and, and, and be very much involved, intimately involved in the, the affairs of this group going forward. She's going to become, you know, not Olympia Brown is going to be the person that takes over sort of as the, the figurehead for this group and, and the leader of this group. Um, if you're not familiar with Reverend Brown. Uh, I look her up. She's got a really amazing story as, as one of the, the, the first woman to um, be the pastor of a universalist church. Um, she went through, you know, first woman to get through all of the um, education and all of that. And uh, yeah, so she, she becomes, um, gets a job in Racine, leading a church in, in Racine, um, and is convinced to kind of get back into the suffrage movement, which was a long time passion of hers. Um, and ultimately that leads to her to um, become the president in 1884 of the WWSA, a post that she is by the way, gonna hold for the next, uh, well, until 1912. So that's, that's gonna be quite, quite a long time. Um, but she does it with the help of Mrs. Almedia Gray and also um, uh, Maria Fowler of Richland Center. And, and this is from her own account of it, but she makes it sound and, and pretty clear that the three of them make are basically the core of um, you know, making things happen in the 1880s as they set out to, to, to make change. So how do they do this? There's, there's sort of two ideas that they're going off of. One is we want to continue to spread the word. We want to uh, make new networks. You know, you have the, the Marathon County chapter up here in 1879. Um, by 1882, or possibly because of the 1882, you know, statewide organization, um, Almedia Gray and her circle in Schofield reach out and to their friends in nearby communities of Grand Rapids and Mosinee to start chapters there. Um, and then they continue to, to spread out. Um, you know, they have uh, you know, lady, men, and, men and women all across central Wisconsin, you may, maybe not as formal members, maybe not as officers, but they're helping out. They're you know, at least friends of the organization. So they're reaching out to make these contacts. But the main thing here, it, they're not necessarily expecting to have like a grassroots campaign that's going to lead to social change. Um, they recognize that suffrage is deeply unpopular. Uh, for the most part, it's, it's, it's certainly not something that people want to do. Um, and so the main thing that they try to do um, to make the change is actually to get suffrage through legislation. Um, they, they look at other states that have some form of women's suffrage and they say, you know, how do they do it? Well, they do it by putting a bill through the legislature. And even if maybe the people aren't on board, they become on board and, and see that, you know, women voting is a good thing. So if we can get a bill through you know, the legislature down in Madison, um, then that'd be an easy way, easier than trying to convince the, the population to, to call for it. So um, they put a couple bills into uh, the legislature in 1885. Uh, one of them, not their plan A, maybe a plan B bill, um, ends up becoming the thing that that is passed. Um, and this gives a partial suffrage. So it wouldn't allow for women to vote anything, but specifically through the sort of feminine the, the, the way that, that women were acting at the time, like school education was something that was more acceptable. So giving them the ability to have a say in school matters, um, you know, that made more sense. And so that's what they did. Um, and this would also, but, but this didn't just like give women partial suffrage or school suffrage, um, you know, to vote for school board members or, you know, that sort of thing. Um, instead, they, um, it's a, uh, it's, it's, it's a bill that needs to be ratified by the, legis uh, the, the people. So there's a, a referendum that's, that's passed later in 18, uh, that, that, that people vote on in 1886. Um, and it passes uh, to, to the surprise. It's, it's not the most, um, it's not the, maybe the most representative election that we've ever had in the history of uh, Wisconsin. Um, about, so they had a gubernatorial election that same year, and the number of voters in that compared to the one that was for the referendum for the for the school suffrage, there's only about a third of the total voters voted in the latter. So, and it's not equally distributed. Um, so, like places like uh, like Marathon County, for example, had 2,700 votes one way or the other, whereas all of Milwaukee County had less than 900. So you can kind of see, you know, Milwaukee at this point is almost eight times more populous than uh, Marathon County. So something else is going on, but nevertheless, it passes. It 
narrow margin, but it does pass. And so in 1887, women get to vote. Um, and I don't want to necessarily breeze past this because this is kind of an important point. Um, women were able to go to the polls like they did in a special election in Stevens Point in 1887. And they could go, they could get a ballot, fill it out, return it, and it counted. And, and they did it. Um, in in, in uh, Stevens Point, about a third of the total voters, about 89 women turned out to the polls to, to vote. I don't know if there was ever a similar election in Marathon County. Um, I, I don't think so, but it's, it's certainly possible. Um, but in 1887, at least there was a few that happened. But I, as, as you can maybe tell by the way that I'm kind of setting this up, you know, it doesn't last. Uh, partially because this is not what the ladies in the WWSA really want. They don't necessarily want to have, you know, a full suffrage, or they want full suffrage. They don't want partial suffrage. So they then look at this and say, well, maybe there's a way to expand the, the, the sort of scope of it. Because the law, as it passed, would kind of dilute it down. It just said that women could vote in issues of school matters or something to that effect, which is pretty vague. And so what they do is they decide to challenge that. They send a couple of women to polls in their local communities and say, try to vote in municipal elections. So not, uh, you know, uh, elections in which there was a county sheriff or a in register of deeds on the on the on the, the poll, the ballot. And one of them um, in particular, Olympia Brown, the, the president, um, she gets turned away. And so in 1887, um, they then proceed to sue the local you know, polling place and, and the, the area to to try to say that we should have been able to vote. And this court case then goes to the the, the circuit court under um, John Judge John Winslow, and Winslow um, agrees with them. And their argument was this: um, issues of school matters is very vague. Yes, a school board means school matters, right? Definitely a school board. Maybe you know school superintendents. That's a school issue. What about county boards or city councils? What about state senators or assembly people? Like these are people who have an impact on the schools. They set funding, um, they, they create you know, uh, guidelines and, and policy. So their argument was they should have gotten the ability to vote. Um, and yeah, he agrees, he agrees with them. Um, unfortunately, in early 1888, however, in January, the, the state Supreme Court you know, gets the case and they, they decide, no, that, that can't stand. Um, the argument is, is, is right. Like, Technically, this would be the natural extension of the, the wording of the bill, but that's not the intent of the bill. That's a pretty wide interpretation of it because it was a referendum for school partial suffrage. And so even though the voters you know, did that, even though the, the, the actual wording of the bill might be interpreted in a more broad way, you know, that's not what the intention was. And so they basically kill women voting um, until such time as um, you know, measures were put in place for separate ballots, essentially. Um, so that way women would just get their separate ballot with only the approved elections that they could vote on and not the, you know, the full thing. Um, so that's a bit of a bummer. It's going to be until 1901 before we, we realize that that's a thing and actually take those steps. So it's going to be about yeah, 15 years, 1902, before women can once again vote in Wisconsin. Um, in the meantime, it's not a great thing for the WWSA. Um, they had put a lot of eggs in this basket, and it went, you know, not the, necessarily the way that they wanted to. Um, court cases are expensive, so they lost a lot of their, you know, they went to debt, uh, you know, pursuing this this measure. In the meantime, they're not out in the community, you know, and even if they, when they do get out in the community, you know, it's a lot easier to get excited and get the people to be engaged when, you know, it's a, when there are, are people you know, it looks like we're going to move forward. Um, after these setbacks, you know, maybe people aren't ex as excited. The, the enthusiasm isn't there, not just among the public, but also among the, the officers. Um, there are, are quite a few of the women here that end up just leaving town, uh, leaving the state, including Elmedia Gray. Uh, she leaves town in 1889. Um, she decides, uh, I actually don't know why she left necessarily. We can kind of guess, but um, in 1889, she goes to California, um, specifically Los Angeles. Um, there, she, she gets involved, you know, surprise, surprise. She gets involved in, in the cause, the struggle. Um, she becomes, you know, the, 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 sec, the, the treasurer for the local chapter of the suffrage union there, um, or the suffrage club uh, association. Um, she gets involved in the temperance union. At one point in 1904, I found this article um, of a local um, um, te uh, temperance union group that got had a meeting and got fired up, and they decide to take it 
um, to the courthouse. So the, a group of women um, end up going to the to the courthouse where uh, we're told that uh, one woman in particular uh, pushed past the, you know, led the group pushing past the um, the counter to the, the desk where the register, uh, the voting register, you know, would, would take place. And um, as the, the article says, um, when a lady with short gray hair, a cotton umbrella in one hand and a book of civil government with the page corners turned down in the other, marched in with an air of settled determination, the employees of the office were amazed. The lady was Mrs. Gray. So here she is leading leading these group of women to, you know, the local courthouse to and, and, and you know, gets there and starts laying into these guys. Hey, we demand the right to vote. We demand to be registered under this, under that. There's that, you know, she's she's just letting them have it. Um, and I think the, the I guess the one thing that that caused all of this to kind of end was a court reporter showed up and started taking pictures at which point the ladies behind her started to maybe think twice and evaporated behind her. Um, so she she then realized the moment was over, turned to leave, but not before telling the man, you know, you're lucky we only got halfway through our arguments that we had ready, uh, which is, yeah, that's a side of Almedia Gray we don't see in Schofield as, as far as I know. Um, you know, maybe, maybe it was happening, maybe it was happening in, in Marathon County back in the 1880s, but I think it was also a matter of, you know, she gets to step outside, you know, Working with the WWSA, there's Olympia, this, this charismatic preacher, um, Almedia Brown, who is, you know, leading everything. So she's just there to kind of help. And now she can kind of step into her own in an environment that's increasingly militant in California. And in California, they actually succeed in getting the vote in 1911. Um, women get the vote in 1911. And again, I don't really know if, you know, Almedia and her friends got the chance to vote in Schofield in 1887, but I know that in 1911, she did register to vote and, you know, I can, you can probably guess that she ex exercised that right uh, for the next 10 years um, until 1921 when she, she did pass. Uh, but even by 1921, that meant that she would have been around to see the passage of the Susan B. Anthony bill, the 19th amendment to the United States Congress, uh, um, constitution. So that's pretty cool. Um, California is actually kind of an interesting thing because they're part of this movement to sort of rebirth of the national suffrage movement. In the sort of the turn of the century, there was sort of a, um, a pessimism among the, 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 the people that were advocating for the right to vote. Um, but they get reinvigorated in 1910 when Washington becomes the first state to, to extend that, the suffrage to women for the first time and in, in 1911 in California. In Wisconsin, um, women here are going to get excited and try to try to continue that momentum, and they put another referendum out to the public to 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 ask people if they want to vote, um, to give women the vote. It's going to fail, but it's you can see that sort of starting again. So we're going to jump ahead to that a little bit. Why did it fail? Well, I, it's it's also kind of mo worth noting that sort of the, the statewide suffrage movement had kind of split up by this point. Olympia Brown was still in charge of the WWSA. But by this point, you know, by the turn of the century, she's basically living in New York at this point. She's still in charge and sending letters and, and, and you know, missives and, and, and articles to, to Wisconsin. And she comes back and visits and speaks occasionally, but she's not really here. And um, her second in command, um, Ada James, um, who is a second generation suffragist. Her, her parents were both very involved in, in the movement. Um, she kind of doesn't, they, they butt heads. And so she goes off um, and founds or, or gets involved in the Political Equality League. And basically these two groups, you know, uh, the, the, the PEL is the one that puts that, that referendum out in 1911, 1912. Um, and they kind of both are trying to make it successful, but they're not coordinating. It's, it's just kind of a, a mess. Um, and ultimately it fails. Um, and after the failure, uh, we're gonna kind of consolidate these groups and it's gonna be put under the control of um, Theodora Winton Humans. Humans is a, you know, the person who is going to be in charge for the last sort of, uh, you know, 10 years leading up to to the suffrage movement here. Um, she got her start and, and, and sort of became um, involved in this sort of thing um, as, as the head of women's clubs. Um, their women's clubs had become sort of a very common thing that you'd see across um, <coughs> um, across the, the state, the, the region. And um, the women, uh, the the Wisconsin Federation of Women's Clubs is founded in 1898, I, I think 98. 1890s, um, and she becomes the president of this. And so she becomes sort of this, this well-known figure, and now she's convinced to, to head the, the suffrage part of it. 
And I mentioned the women's clubs because that gets us back to, to, to Marathon County. Um, there were a few uh, women's clubs in various forms over the years. Probably the most you know, prominent and certainly the one we know most about is the Ladies Literary Society in Wausau. Um, these are ladies who get together in 1877 uh, initially to, to talk about literature. It's, it's kind of like a book club in the sense that these are, these are women who you know, have maybe some education. Um, certainly they're, they're well off. They're, they're married to the professionals and the business owners and the, you know, the richer uh, well off people in town. So they have some money that they can you know, hire some domestic servants, some, some cooks, maids, what have you. So they're not necessarily doing everything like most women are. And they can spend some time to you know, read some Shakespeare and then get together with some friends once a month to talk about Shakespeare um, or, you know, poetry or, you know, whatever. Um, but the main thing here is it's not just a book club because they also see this as an opportunity to elevate the culture in Wisconsin. And so they end up, um, you know, bringing in speakers like Susan B. Anthony um, and poets and authors and, um, you know, theater companies, um, musicians, it's all, you know, trying to promote the arts. These are women who I don't think, you know, they, in, in some places, you know, by 1912, for example, when that, that national or that statewide referendum is going on, the, the, the Federation of Women's Clubs in Wisconsin, they, they vote, you know, not unanimously, but they do vote to support it. But individual clubs sometimes became sort of active in the movement and sometimes they didn't. And this is one that doesn't. There's a couple of reasons for this. Um, you know, by the 1890s, they had kind of, it's a more conservative sort of attitude. I think these are women who, you know, they came of age in the time, you know, they, they could see people like Elmedia Gray who were, you know, saw the in, inequality in, in, you know, in the world and said, we need to do something about this. They had also seen how people, you know, had responded to their successes and failures. Uh, they had seen how, uh, uh, you know, the papers kind of were, were, were clearly uncomfortable with how enthusiastic that Olympia Brown was when they won that first court case uh, for it. Like, ah, you're too, you're too excited about this. It's not a ladylike way to do this. And so when these ladies, you know, of the literary society, these women, um, they, they kind of are also interested in, in getting involved in the public sphere to an extent, but maybe not quite so militantly, I guess you could say, they're not so forceful. They wanna do it gradually and, and in a way that's gonna make sense for them. So what they do is they do things like, instead of going out and saying, we demand that the right to vote, they find projects like the public library. Um, we have a public library system like we do here in Marathon County, in a part because the ladies in Wassa decided to, it was a cause that they were, wanted to support. They raised money to, to buy books, to build the building, to keep the programs going. You know, these are the sort of things like public library is, is you know, nobody's going to get angry about that. It's a, it's a thing that everybody can get behind. Um, they were also doing things, you know, in line with the, the wider um, statewide club movement, um, things like putting women in positions of, you know, somewhat authority. So such as Mrs. Bird, who was a member of the uh, Literary Society, um, she becomes the first woman to sit on the Wassa School Board. Um, so again, kind of, you know, putting women into the public sphere, but in, in a way that is going to be less objectionable. But that doesn't mean that the women aren't in favor of it. These are the Yankees. These are the Protestants. These are the, the women who are exactly the demographic that would be involved in the suffrage movement. And yet, you, you know, they don't, as a group, you know, in, encourage that. But individually, they do a little bit. Uh, particularly, I want to shout out, you know, Mrs. Rosenberry's example here. Um, Charlotte, I think, was her name. Um, Charlotte, um, in 1912, when the, the, the referendum was going around, she, she brought in and is credited with bringing in people like uh, Maude McCleary. Um, Maude is from Green Bay, um, but she's a member of the PEL and she goes from city to city giving speaks, uh, speaking to, to encourage the people you know, to get people interested and excited about, about women's suffrage. Um, and she speaks here at the First Methodist Church, as well as at the courthouse in 1912. Um, there's a couple of other people that brought in. Um, Mrs. Rosenberry also had an influence on, you know, creating discourse around this in 1912. She was the head of the um, Home and Education Department. Um, this is the department that is in, in charge of, um, well, it's not a department. So basically by this point, there are so many people that they were getting together in each other's like living rooms and dining rooms. But once you have 90 people, you know, it gets a little unwieldy. So they split it off into departments. The Ladies Literary Society might have a, a home and an education, an art and literature, a study and reform or a study in philanthropy. 
Um, so this is this is the department here. And in 1912, um, she has a program called Suffrage versus Anti-Suffrage. Um, the ladies got together. It wasn't a full meeting or anything, but they the, the ones that did participate um, were told are came across generally in favor of it. This is the first time the S word shows up in the documents that of literary society. Like we don't have those, uh, and and we we do have the the records going back to the mid eight, you know, well into the 1890s. Um, so this is the first time that they're officially talking about it, right? Um, the the rest of this of the of the of the year here are all of the the programs they're doing. There's some political stuff in here, right? Uh, women's political influence, the influence on social conditions, uh, business women. Um, so in some situations, certain women like Mrs. Rosenberry, Mrs. Van Vechten, I think would have been part of this group um, and, and others, uh, you know, were able to kind of have discussions. And, and, and this is very typical of the, the club movement that was taking place. Um, you know, this wasn't a club activity, but this was an individual thing. If we're going to make change, it's going to be more as an individual, you know, way to do this. But, you know, 1914, two years later, when somebody else takes over, another group of women take over, the entire theme for the, 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 this, the, the year is Alaska, the land of opportunity, where they talk about, you know, the gold rush and the native peoples. And they're not really necessarily talking about it as a contemporary political issue like Mrs. Rosenberry's uh, year had been. So it really depends on the individual. And you can kind of see this being the case. So the reason I kind of pointed this out is, is to show that, yes, women were having these discussions in these clubs and presumably outside of them and that there were leaders to an extent that were, were here. Um, but on the other hand, uh, the club itself doesn't become a, uh, you know, a mechanism for making change because there are these conservative elements, because there's this sort of perception of maybe we don't want to do something that is going to be seen as political, um, even if maybe majority of the members were in favor of it. And I think there is a good reason for that. If we look, you know, at the, uh, oh, oh, and I will say, uh, yeah, Forgot to put this in here. Um, in 1919, when um, the the Susan B. Anthony bill, the 19th Amendment, goes up for ratification by Wisconsin, um, they do send a letter to the legislature saying we would, you know, we would like you su to support this. Um, so they they do come around, but it's going to be 1919 is pretty late to come as a supporter. Um, although maybe that's that's the nature of things, uh, particularly being here in Marathon County, because if we go back to that 1912 referendum, um, this is kind of the county by county breakdown of how people voted. In general, only about 37% of the state uh, was in favor of giving the women the vote. Um, so 63% said no, which is a pretty, pretty big margin. But, uh, you know, Marathon County, 23% in favor of it, which is not a huge, you know, number of people. And, and you know, this is a map that looks very similar to another map, this map, which is the percentage of German stock people in 1910. Um, yeah, so let's talk about the Germans because the Germans are often said to be one of the big obstacles. And certainly with the large German population that we have here in Marathon County and sort of the surrounding area, like it definitely played a, a, a role here. I would, I would say it's definitely the case. So why, why? Well, Germans are not one group of people, right? They are, there's Catholics and there's Lutherans. They, they come from the, the, the mountains of, of Austria speaking high German. They come from the, the lowlands in, in Pomerania speaking Plattdeutsch. There's people who live in farms and cities. They're, you know, Democrats, Republicans, socialists. They, they don't necessarily all conform to one idea of, a, of, you know, a person. And yet there are kind of two issues that they will rally against universally. They come together. One, you don't tell them that they can't speak German in, in their homes, in their schools, in their churches. Um, they will vote anybody out who says otherwise. Um, the other issue is don't take away the alcohol. Now, I don't, don't think that the Germans were... There's a couple of reasons for this, right? Like we said at the beginning, the Germans, uh, the, the, the suffrage and the temperance movement are linked. You can't really separate them as much as they tried to. They tried to turn it into a suffrage issue and kind of downplay the temperance. But that, uh, you know, the people who were screaming loudest for the right to vote were also the same people saying we ought to have uh, an alcohol free society. And the Germans, uh, you know, that's an attack on Germanness. The Germans like their beer, they like their wine. There's an there's an interesting discussion. I, I don't know to what extent it's true personally, but um, I've, I've heard that, you know, in general, the Germans weren't opposed to, to temperance. Um, they thought, you know, that's not a bad idea. But, you know, we drink light stuff. We like, you know, beer and wine. 
It's not like those Brit the, the British descended people in Yankees, right? They are the ones with the drinking problem. They're the ones that are drinking whiskey and, and you know, the, the really hard stuff. So it's no wonder that they're the ones that think there ought to be changed. Like, don't don't throw us under the bus because you can't, you know, you have alcohol issues. Um, I don't know to what extent that's true, but certainly it is a big part of their sort of identity. But it's also worth noting that it's also a big part of their economic reality. Um, if, if in 1912, we suddenly got rid of all alcohol and we made it illegal, um, you know who disproportionately would be hit by that? It would be the Germans. They're the ones that own the beer, the breweries, they own the distilleries, they own the uh, beer gardens and taverns and saloons. And so they see an attack on alcohol as an attack on Germanness. And, and not for nothing, uh, a lot of the the set the, the the language used to describe the 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 temperance movement in sort of the people who were it, it wanted it were also very nativist. They were very anti-immigrant, and so this wasn't just something that they were saying, "Oh, this is our thing." They understood that you know they were being targeted by some people. Not not all of them, but certainly there was a component that used this as a political issue to try to you know take control away from the Germans uh, for their. <laughs> On their part, uh, the Germans funnel quite a lot of money through the, you know, the Breweries Association and the Tavern Keepers League. And, you know, I, I understand, again, I don't know firsthand, I haven't seen all of this stuff, but uh, some of that money got used to stop the 1912 suffrage bill, uh, bill um, and other things in ways that were maybe not the most ethical. I, I'm not sure about that, but but certainly um, they are become the biggest proponent against suffrage because of its associations with temperance. But this changes, right? It changes largely because of World War One. World War One changes a whole lot um, on on a number of levels, but certainly if the Germans are the main you know obstacle to getting women voting. You know, World War One causes a bit more more of an issue for the German American community here because Germany and America are at war with one another. You can't be a German and an American at the same time. You got to choose. Um, and so, in this reality, you know, the German American Alliance, this you know informal or sometimes formal group of, of voters that would, you know, if the Democrats are are telling you that you have to speak English in your schools, well, next next poll opportunity, we're going to vote Republican. But you can't do that when both parties are telling you that you cannot be a German. Incidentally, they vote socialist, which is a whole other story. Um, and we have a, a pretty big number of socialists elected in, in Wisconsin and in, in here in Marathon County. Uh, but the point is, you know, over the course of this, they, they're, they're not as concerned about making sure those ladies who want, you know, to vote um, need to be stopped. In part, also, you know, consider that the 18th Amendment, which made national prohibition of alcohol a thing, that happens in 1918. So when the time that the, the national uh, amendment, the 19th amendment that would have given women the right to vote comes up, you know, the Germans are thinking like, all right, well, what are they gonna do? If we, are the ladies gonna take away our alcohol a second time? You know, we're already there. The other thing, maybe more importantly though, is the mobilization of women as part of the war workforce. This is not just something that is, okay, the Germans are done and I guess we could push forward because the, the women of this country are called upon like no other point in, in human history to, to mobilize for the war effort. We need women to win and we need women to, you know, not to, you know, grab a bayonet and, and rifle and go to the front, but we need them to volunteer to, to um, you know, even if it's just within the, the sort of home, uh, you know, the sphere, the, the public, private life that women are kind of relegated to traditionally, like women need to reduce the amount of waste that happens when they, they make dinner, like don't make too much. That's patriotic. Canning uh, and preserves, like that is a, one of the most patriotic things that, a, that someone can do during World War I because it reduces the waste. Um, but there's more than that, you know, women who may get together for like a knitting circle or for like a, 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 late, a church um, aid society, um, instead of, you know, raising money to, to help maintain the, the buildings of the sanctuary, what have you, they're getting together and they're knitting socks and making bandages and they're volunteering for the Red Cross. Red Cross becomes this organization that, that, that women take part in, but also take leadership in. And it's not just groups like the Red Cross, like the, the local civil uh, defense councils and things like that. You know, women were taking an active role in it. And notably, it's not just, again, it's not just the, the, the rich affluent Yankees Protestants up on North Hill. They're not the only ones that are doing this. Every part of society, all women are called upon and expected and, and, and do step forward to do their part uh, for the most part. So when things are all said and done, you know, 
men men who are who who after the war in 1918 1919 say you know we could not have done this without the help of the women of america thank you for your your, your everything you did you know it would be very disingenuous to say okay but now go back in the kitchen and don't worry your little head about you know getting involved outside of the home like it'd be very disingenuous to do that and maybe more to the point women weren't about to let that happen they had stepped into the public sphere and thrived they were they found a place um and 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 you know they weren't about to 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 give that up um and so you know when 1919 rolls around and the you know wilson finally signs the 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 amendment to the constitution goes to the states to ratify um wisconsin is right there at the front um to ratify actually so i'll briefly cover this this story um we happened to be in session when the the bill came or the the amendment came to ratify um as did illinois and both of them, both legislatures threw it to the front and ratified it on the exact same day. And then it matters who actually, but it doesn't matter who does it first, because technically they were an hour ahead of Wisconsin. But who gets the receipts, right? So you have to actually physically take the paperwork and submit it in Washington, D.C. So there's this race down from our state capitals to Washington, D.C. Um, they beat us there, but they have some paperwork in not in order. And so um, it turns out that uh, Wisconsin gets in first uh, and, and becomes the first to be acknowledged as ratifying the 19th Amendment. You know, is that fair? Uh, who knows? I, I think at least it is a, a a welcome acknowledgement of the women in the suffrage movement who for, for decades had been working towards this goal of women's suffrage in this country and had, you know, nowhere else had women worked so hard and yet found so few such such few successes as in Wisconsin. Um, and so it's a nice sort of to nod there. Now, this, I guess, gets us back to the, the question that I, you know, Silly me, I, I, I made my title a question, so I, I, I guess I should probably answer it. Um, you know, I, I, this is a, a headline that I grabbed from a 1912 or 1914 headline, a newspaper headline. Um, in that context, there's sort of two arguments here. It is a it, it is a reading of this statement: "Will the women vote?" as a question of, um, you know, will will we finally give women the ability to take part in the democracy of our country? But it also can mean, if we do, are they actually going to go out and vote? The answer to both of those questions is yes, as, as we know in retrospect, but it's a, it's a yes with a sort of caveat there. Yes, women, the 19th Amendment excludes, uh, makes it so that you cannot exclude someone from the franchise, from the ability to vote because they are a woman. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you can't find other reasons not to give them the vote. And of course, you know, this is something we always have to have to say that, you know, African-American women, Asian American women on the West Coast, um, you know, Native American women, they don't necessarily have the same access to voting as as white women across the country do. Um, you know, it's 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 an unfortunate reality. But you know, sometimes if you're uh, if you're black in this country, you know, you don't have the same access to the to the what's guaranteed rights as as whites do. So uh, that's that's an unfortunate thing. It's worth worth pointing out because it's an important point uh, to keep in mind. Um, as to the other question, yes, people do vote. Women do go out to vote. Um, by my calculations, well, I think I think Wassa probably had in the, the first opportunity to vote under the Nineteenth Amendment. Um, there was a September primary election, um, and I think in Wassa in particular, I found that um, around maybe twenty percent of the eligible women voted, which is not bad. Um, about eighty percent of the men voted. so um, they still have a ways to catch up in terms of the equal number of votes, but um, they're gonna get there because um, this is new and it's gonna take a little time. you have groups that get started to, you know, provide a, 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 um, um, a civic lessons and a sort of guidance on how do you vote and what what the you know all of this stuff means. Um, in particular, you have the League of Women Voters becomes the sort of successor to the national suffrage movement. Um, and they um, get started here as a chapter in 1923. Um, and their their goal here is, is not necessarily to, to make women um, a political force in the same sense that maybe they had been harnessed for the suffrage movement to get that victory. Instead, their intention was to provide a, a nonpartisan education, um, give, give women the opportunity to learn how the process works and what they need to, to make it happen um, and, and um, all of that. Um, and this brings up maybe maybe the other question. I you know the title for this is "Will the women vote?" But probably the better vote, better question long term is what do they do with the vote once they get it? Because that's that maybe gets a better insight into what this whole thing was about. Um, here in Marathon County, we have 
the strange example of two women who end up becoming um, fairly important within the the suffrage movement, um, or not uh, outside of the suffrage movement. Um, you have Helen Ho Helen Ohm in, in Wausau becomes the first city councilwoman in 1922. And then two years later, uh, Mildred Barber becomes the first assemblywoman for, for Marathon County, being elected to the first district. And it's... <laughs> It's kind of interesting because this would maybe imply that Marathon County is a little bit more progressive than we had shown ourselves to be in, in you know, previous opportunities. But it's also worth noting that neither of these women, while they were, you know, had this moment in, 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 in representing us, you know, Helen Ohm is the first city councilwoman in 1922. She comes back during World War II for a little bit, but the second woman to be elected to the city council is going to be 50 years, 1972, with Mary McLean. After Mildred Barber is defeated in the uh, Republican primary um, after her, her first term, um, there has never been another woman to hold that seat. So I think, you know, if, if you look at the suffrage movement and the continuation of it as purely a political thing, which, which sometimes, you know, you do, it makes it kind of easy to, to follow this, you know, even, even though there are some, some victories here early in the 20s, it's going to be a while before women get sort of mobilized specifically for issues that are important to them, as opposed to just the, you know, again, women, women are not like, like the Germans. There's maybe a couple issues that, that might get their, you know, them to, to vote together, but in general, you know, we're a very diverse community. And so we have women representing different perspectives. And I think maybe the, the better, sort of inheritance of the 19th Amendment and the movement is not necessarily, you know, the the women who are elected to office, because that's going to be a while before that becomes more more common. It's going to be these women. It's going to be the women who are entering the workforce, um, you know, in, in large, larger numbers, and not just as domestic servants or, you know, maybe maybe a, a one-room schoolhouse teacher like we had before, which maybe again extensions of the the the, the home, the, the sphere for women. But they're breaking out of that mold. They're they're tearing around the streets of of Wassa and and Edgar um, and you know all over, all over the mid, the mid central Wisconsin, um, on bicycles, just like men are in the 19 teens, you know, they're, they're taking part in sports and they're getting in, into offices. So, so the, the real next sort of chapter of women's history here in Marathon County is maybe not political in the same way that it was before and, and will be later, but it's more of a social thing. And, and for that reason, you know, um, uh, that, that, you know, it's, Maybe maybe beyond this talk, I'm, I'm I don't know how, how I'm doing on time. I'm sure I'm a little bit uh, close to my my time here, so uh, won't go into that, um, and we'll just kind of leave it there for today. So uh, yeah, that's that's the talk. Um, I guess with that, we can maybe um, get Chad back in here. Yeah. Thank you very much, Ben. That was really informative. I learned some things that I had not known before. Um, we don't have any questions yet. Just a reminder, if you're watching us on Facebook Live, you can post a comment there. If you're watching us on YouTube Live, um, you can post a comment there as well. Um, I think Ben and I are the only ones tuned in via Zoom, but that's okay. If you're yeah, on Zoom or you wanna join us there, you can post a question there too in the chat feature. But um, one question that I had, I. Certainly, so this is all about women, but the 19th Amendment does not happen without men. Um, and I'm curious to, to as things <laughs> occasionally do, go back to men involved. Um, are there men in Marathon County that you know of who were especially progressive and supportive of women's suffrage, whether that's John Gray or others. Are there, um, are there men that come to mind that really took, took the yeah. women's cause and tried to advance it among, among their fellow men? The, the name that comes to mind is is probably Neil Brown, um, who was, was a lawyer here. He comes around 1880. Um, his father and aunt actually ran, um, I think Richland Center was where they're from. Um, could be wrong about that. Uh, but but Emma Brown is like the voice of the suffrage movement in the 1870s and 80s. Um, and that's her, his, his aunt. So he is definitely grew up in an environment in which this was something that was important to him. Um, and, and certainly I, I think he did, I'm trying to, trying to think, I think, I think he was, he, he's one of the people that's, that's mentioned in like, 
there's not a lot of historiography. There's not a lot of history that's been written about here. Again, that's kind of my, my attempt to try to fill that in. Uh, one of the few things, moments where we do see Wassa mentioned, for example, is, hey, Neil Brown is, is here. And he is a member of the sort of the men's uh, league like it's, it's kind of interesting because usually women get involved in a cause as the auxiliary club of to it and there's sort of like a, a mirror image of that here um but again i, I don't know wasa is interesting in that you know neil brown is a member of the wasa group you know this this group of men who are uh you know maybe got rich or you know well off here to the lumber industry but decided to stick around and reinvest you know so if somebody needed needed some help somebody to come on the board and help kind of give it infuse a capital for your com company you could you could talk to them and they would they would help you out um and that the philosophy there was very much you know one of you know leave your politics at the door and I think this is something that was probably one of the other reasons why the literary society was like this. They inherited that from that that sort of ethos here of, you know, there are there are better things that we can. We don't have to get into political squabbles. There are things that we can do to advance the cause that everybody's going to be behind. And I think that's probably part of the reason. I, I will say also, um, there are a lot of women and and men that um, I see kind of here and there, but just didn't, because this came together pretty quickly and, and you know, 2020 is not the easiest year to do archival research. Uh, so I had the resources I had, you know, as time goes on, I hope to kind of maybe fill in the gaps and maybe maybe some of those stories will come to light and, and, and maybe you'll get a better idea of, you know, the involvement of, you know, John, John Gray's story or, um, you know, Neil Brown and some of them, pe those people as well. Hmm. And to kind of put this in perspective on maybe, I, I guess maybe a more of a global scale, um, you mentioned certainly the influence of the German American population in Marathon County. Um, how do other countries compare like Germany when it comes to women's suffrage? Do you, do you know that? I mean, by the well, time this was coming yeah. out, coming about in the United States. I mean, where were other countries at as far as women's suffrage goes? Yeah, and it's interesting with the Germans because um, they get kind of called out as being the force because because they were so wrapped up in the anti-temperance, they, they kind of were this sticking, you know, barrier to a lot of communities to, to do this. But actually, if you look at it, Germany itself gives women the right to vote in 1918, you know, over a year before we do here. <clears throat> And, and so there's kind of a, an interesting thing here where during World War I, you know, again, it kind of becomes a patriotic because the Germans were not known to be anti-suffrage, supporting suffrage is a patriotic thing that we can do. Um, but at the same time, you know, when it comes time, you know, and I, we didn't really get into the, sort of the, the national movement that, that, you know, it, there's a lot of states that were sort of moving to try to do it locally, but the real success ultimately, as we know, comes at the national level, because that's the way we, we get it all across. And that movement, you know, one of the ways that they put pressure on, on, on Woodrow Wilson to change his mind and some of the senators and, and you know, people that were kind of not on, you know, kind of on the fence about it was to point out that like, hey, Germany just gave their women to vote, the right to vote. Um, you know, the Scandinavian countries, uh, Britain, it, you know, Italy's thinking about it, France is thinking about it, Japan and China have women's voting, like, we don't want to be the last modern country to do this. So we better kind of, you know, let's not wait another, you know, election cycle to make this happen. Because if we do, we're going to be, the, you know, the we're going to, it's embarrassing, you know. Um, so yeah, that's, that's definitely the case. And, and certainly the, the sort of international connections, you know, the, the, the term suffragette is sort of a Brit, British thing. Um, you know, they have a very, uh, an inspiring kind of uh, sort of very militant uh, uh, ways to make this happen to gain public opinion. Um, and, and so certainly that did affect a lot, again, on the national, I don't know about the local, you know, Wisconsin story. I don't know if that had much of an impact, but certainly, you know, you had people who were over with the Pankhursts in, in, in Britain that came over and sort of brought those lessons to the movement in the 19 teens in the United States. So um, yeah, it's it's interesting because it is it isn't just a it is a local story, but you know increasingly it becomes a much wider scale, um, it, you know, towards the end for sure. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, I don't see any other questions at the moment on the other platforms here, but um, yeah, that's right. Um, 
I will say, you know, if, if anybody, if you're watching this after the fact, you know, feel free, I'll, I'll go back and check questions and see if maybe there's a, a way to answer some of those. If, if, if you think of it later, um, feel free to, to do that. I'm curious too, kind of branching out a bit as far as suffrage for African Americans in this yeah. country, which came about in the 1860s. Um, so it would be, yeah, another 50 years or so before women were granted the right to vote. And I'm, I mean, I guess, I don't know. I'm always surprised that it took until 1919 <laughs> when you're talking about the women's right to vote. I mean, it, yeah, yeah, I don't know. I guess I'm just, um, yeah, and 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 that's a, one of the like the African American is is a that community is is a is a good explanation for why partially why it takes so long. Um, the, one of the reasons why, you know, by the turn of the century, the focus isn't about the national scheme like like we ultimately see successful. We kind of went back and said, you know. The, the Wisconsin suffragists are a little uncomfortable with having to choose between the ideals of equality, which would mean that, you know, black people should be able to take part as well. Um, and also the the white women in the South who didn't want that to be the case. If they're the ones that are the organizing, you know, there, there's a whole thing of, um, let's see, I think it was in Milwaukee, there was a big convention and, and it, it ended up being like this big rift of, do we allow the, you know, the, the, the the African American sort of affiliate groups to participate or not, um, and and that's one of the reasons why it take it does take so long. Um, you know, it, it, we 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 ratify it in 1919, and it we don't have it as a law until 1920 because it takes Tennessee. You know, it's the last state to do it, and and some of the states, you know, in the southern part, you know, Alabama, Mississippi. I think the last state to ratify it is 1982, which <laughs> which doesn't mean that you know you don't have to ratify it to make it law, but it you know. To do the right thing and say this is something that's right. It took until 1982 for all of the states to say that this is an important thing. So yeah, it is definitely a stumbling block, and it is something that is, you know, it, it it's it's a tough tough issue for them for sure. Yeah, yeah. and I, I'm curious too, like around the the turn of the century and even in the the first couple of decades, Wisconsin, of course, was predominantly. I would think it's safe to say predominantly Caucasian. Oh, yeah. um, are there any men well, or women yeah. from the African American community who make their way into Wisconsin or even into central Wisconsin more specifically? To yeah, in, in, in 19, the 1920 census actually says um, that there are three adult ne Negroes living in Wassa. Um, Two just men three. and one woman. Just three in all of 1920. In 1920. And that's even surprising. Um, I, 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 have, I, I I spent an afternoon trying to track down the woman just because I, I was curious, like, what brings you here? I know that the, the two men were working at the Bellis Hotel. One was a cook and one was a, a porter or something like that. Um, I think we see a little bit more, you know, again, with the railroad, you see a little bit more diversity, um, maybe on the on the western part of the state where the railroad kind of goes through um, in some places. Uh, but again, it's, it is, it is, yeah, we, we are very white. We are not, um, in, although back then, you know, whiteness wasn't as uniform, you know, are you native versus foreign born? Are you an immigrant? That became more predominant. Um, but yeah, it, it does add an interesting dimension because, you know, clearly they were aware of race as an issue um, and they were probably talking about it but it wasn't as big of a maybe motivating factor because it's not it's not really a thing here so yeah. you know hmm. but yeah that 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 woman that was here I, I i would i would imagine she probably didn't vote in 1920 just because so little people did and but but i don't know maybe maybe she did that would be yeah. you know again really really cool to find out but uh, hard to know yeah sure sure all right. Well, let's see. Um, oh, apparently there are more than just the two of us on Zoom. Somebody posted oh. a message on our Facebook page. So thank you very much for tuning in, uh, Paula. Um, good to know. Yeah. So um, I don't see too many. I don't see any other questions yeah. from the group, but um, yeah, as Ben mentioned, if you are watching this later, 
um, the archived video and you're looking for some more information, either just for your own mind or for a school project or, or whatever, um, they are an incredible resource. The library sends people to the Historical Society all the time. And um, I know they send people to us as well. So we're happy to work together with them. And if you have questions about women's suffrage in general, and in particular, the, the local impacts and effects and that sort of thing, by all means, get, a, get in touch with Ben at the Historical Society. Um, and just uh, another reminder, in case you weren't uh, tuned in right at the beginning, the Historical Society and the library do have a couple, a uh, few more programs coming up. Gary Gisselman, the, library at the librarian at the Historical Society, is doing a couple of history chats, talks on 12, at 12.30 12 p.m. Uh, the next couple of Thursdays, the 24th, and again on October 2nd. Uh, on the 24th, this coming Thursday, the topic is church schools, uh, schools started by churches in Marathon County. And then on October 1st, Gary will talk about Marathon County schools in the 20th century as they progressed. And the next History Speaks on the Air talk will be by Dr. Brett Barker on October 17th at 2 p.m. He will be talking about the famous Lincoln-Douglas debates of 1858. And um, the library also is a part of the uh, sponsor of, organizer of the Central Wisconsin Book Festival, which starts on Monday and on Tuesday night in collaboration with WIPS, the Wisconsin Institute for Public Policy and Service. We will be do, uh, presenting a talk by Rebecca Boggs Roberts on women's suffrage in the 19th century. And that will be on more of a national scale. So we appreciate Ben's time bringing this down to the local level. Um, but on Tuesday night, Rebecca Roberts um, will give a presentation uh, with more of a national perspective on the anniversary of suffrage. So, um, well, I think that should probably do it. Ben, yeah. what do you say? <laughs> yeah, that, that sounds good. Okay. Um, and again, we want to thank thank Chad for, for stepping in and helping us moderate and and join us for this. It's a it's a fun fun topic to talk about. We're we're happy to to uh, you know bring it to to more people. And thank you very much, Ben, for all the work that you put in to to put all this together. I definitely learned some things, and hopefully others did too. So thank you all very much for tuning in today. We really appreciate it.